<laughs> Good morning. Happy Sunday at DEF CON. <laughs> Thank you for coming to our talk. Because we can, we're flying in a Cessna. I'm uh, Sean McKeever. I'm a senior security researcher. And uh, I do other stuff from Metro Detroit. Sometimes I race cars. Matt Thomason, also Metro Detroit. Uh, my day job is in security and has pretty much nothing whatsoever to do with war flying. I am also a commercial multi-engine pilot, uh, instrument rating, and licensed airframe and power plant mechanic. And all of the opinions are expressed here are our own. Yeah. And probably have nothing to do with our respective employers. I didn't even tell them I was coming. All right, so the story. It's November 2019, and I was awash in a sea of mats, Matt. Um, this was our cube area. I had a mat and a mat and a mat, coffee, and then a not mat. Um, so we're sitting around, it's, you know, like I said, November, DEF CON had come and gone, and Matt and I are like, let's do a, a DEF CON talk. I'm like, yeah, but I tried that. I can't talk about work. What else are we gonna talk about? Matt goes, I have a plane. I'm like, uh, oh, Wi-Fi? Like, yeah, let's do that. And then 2020 happens. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, we did finally get together and, and do it. Um, war flying, it's like war driving or war dialing or as in greetings, Professor Falcon. Um, we're looking for wireless access points uh, from the air and there are unfortunately no weapons involved. Fortunately, I said fortunately. Fortunately, yeah. And so we're war flying in a Cessna not these Cessnas. Cessna has actually made warplanes, but we weren't using those. Although the L-19 on the bottom is kind of close. Uh, if somebody wants to donate an L-19 for further research, please see me afterwards. Our Cessna was more like this. Cessna 182. Uh, not this airplane, because I think that one's registered for... Not in the U.S. Um, but four-seat airplane. High wing, which gives us a little better visibility to the ground. 230-horsepower 200, 200, engine. Cruises comfortably around 150 miles an hour, and one nice thing is we've got six hours of fuel, so with reserve figure five hours, we can go for a long time, a long distance if we want to do such. Few disclaimers, this is not legal advice. Neither of us is a lawyer. This is not flight instruction. We are not flight instructors. We are also not expert war drivers, but we are grateful to the war driving community that has made great tools like Wiggle, and many of those people are over in the uh, RF Hackers Village. And we're not the first to do this. During our research, found that about 20 years ago, somebody wrote a paper on collecting data on wireless access points from the air, but there doesn't seem to have been a lot of discussion or work on the topic since then. So we thought it was worth doing some experimenting and firing up the conversation again. Why would we do this? Big reason, three magic words, line of sight. Radio frequencies, especially in the Wi-Fi ranges, are very subject to interference from the ground, from objects, vegetation, buildings, houses. Am I um, hopefully doing okay with my mic position here, but am I, is that better? Okay. Hey, okay, I should know how to do this. Anyway, um, so, trying to raise one end of the device on the end of the radio conversation, potentially we have much greater distance and much greater line of sight. And airplanes are cool, radios are cool. We were curious, maybe we can see a lot of access points quickly. Um, and there's a fair amount of discussion right now about the interaction of aircraft and RF and what radio signals can do with those. So we thought it was an interesting topic to explore. Few constraints we'll talk through. One, safety. And I'm going to belabor this a little bit because I don't want to read any NTSB reports about somebody who crashed an airplane trying to look for wireless access points. So seriously, the job of the pilot in this is fly the airplane. And this is often expressed in aviation as aviate, navigate, and communicate. First job, aviate, which is keep the airplane flying, keep the shiny side up, keep it at a proper airspeed, don't run into anything. 
if and only if you are successfully aviating, then figure out where you are and figure out where you're going. If and only if you are successfully aviating and navigating, then maybe think about talking to somebody on the radio about what you're doing. At no point in here, get distracted by scanning equipment, shiny electronic displays in the airplane. Ah, that looks cool. Um, particularly during critical phases of flight, taxi takeoff, approach, landing, and low-level maneuvering. Because when you're doing war flying, you may want to be down closer to the ground, and that increases risk. Is it possible to, or, or so, because of this war flying, we think is best done as a team sport, because, hey, it's more fun to share the flight with somebody anyway. Is it possible to war fly safely while solo? I think it is. We'll talk about the details of that a little bit later. Um, but obviously want to be watching the constraints. I will mention this issue specifically as a reference to why I'm concerned about this. Not that long ago, not very far away from where we live, there was a Cessna 182 that crashed and based on the NTSB report, there's strong evidence that the pilot was in the process of taking a Snapchat video and making a post and got distracted, got a little left of the course, flew into the guy wires of a tower, crashed and died. So distraction, especially at low level, especially during low level maneuvering can be fatal. So please, please, please pilot fly the airplane. And if you are flying with the pilot, um, as the scanner, if the pilot is not comfortable doing something, don't do it and don't distract the pilot. Uh, regulations, basically the FAA says it's the responsibility of the aircraft operator to determine if the portable electronic device will interfere with the operation of the aircraft. So as a pilot, figure out, will this interfere with the operation of the aircraft? Also, uh, remember FAR 91.3, the pilot in command of an aircraft is directly responsible for and is the final authority as to the operation of that aircraft. So if you are the scanner, the pilot's word is, is law on safety things. Also, 9113, the great catch-all, careless and reckless operation is prohibited. So don't do anything stupid while you're flying around trying to collect access point data. Uh, FCC perspective, FCC basically does not want cell phones in cell phone mode trying to talk to cell phone towers while flying around. So put your phone in airplane mode and you can still have your Wi-Fi on, have your GPS on, which are what you need for collecting uh, wireless access or uh, wireless access point data. Where can you war fly? Know your airspace. So we're from Metro Detroit area and Detroit Metro Airport has this nice big thing called a Class Bravo airspace which you can visualize as an upside down wedding cake centered around the primary airport and the Class Bravo airspace is well protected and you can only get in there with explicit permission if you're on either if you're on an instrument flight plan or if the approach controllers say you can come in here this is a very good safety thing because it lets all of the airliners get in and out safely heavy traffic areas and it works well for what we're doing we are probably not on an instrument flight plan unless we happen to be war flying while we're going somewhere but if we're trying to gather data about a specific area we're probably operating under something called visual flight rules which means we're doing our own navigation and we're responsible for our own traffic separation but we've got a lot of flexibility in where we can do that but we need to stay out of the Class Bravo for sure. And then there are smaller airports that we want to be watching for so we don't go get in their traffic patterns and runways. Uh, Pontiac Airport that we fly out of is a Class Delta. So they have a control tower. They own that airspace. They're, um, they're pretty nice and flexible on working with us for maneuvering that we need to do. And so you have a lot more options out of Class Delta airspace. But at the end of the day, it's their airspace. So we have to comply with what they want. Overpopulated areas, it's legal to fly a thousand feet. You have to you have to stay a thousand feet above the ground. Over unpopulated areas, you can go down to 500 feet. Where we were trying to fly, like over the suburbs of Metro Detroit, we basically had an area between a thousand feet and 3,000 feet above the ground that we could get in to 
maintain clearance above the ground, but stay below the Class Bravo shelf. So that kind of um, constrained where we were able to go, but we were still able to uh, collect some good data. Also, an airplane is a metal box, or at least a lot of them. Um, Cessna 182 is an, an aluminum box with plexiglass windows. So we want to get the radios up out of the aluminum box and put them as close as we can to the plexiglass windows so that they can receive Wi-Fi. And that was one of the things that we were curious about. How well does this work if we're inside the airplane and just getting the radios through the plexiglass? So next year, I'm going to be outside the airplane? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll attach a safety line, though, okay, so cool. it'll work well. Um, optimally, the antenna would be outside the airplane, but you get into some issues with regs and safety and stuff. One, if you're trying to permanently attach something to the airplane, and two, just practically, you don't want to try attaching it and then have it not work and fall off, and then you're calling the tower saying, hey, can you see if my phone fell off on the runway? <laughs> Also, from a privacy perspective, this is probably the least stealthy way to war drive because you're in a big metal box making a lot of noise, flying over everybody's head with a 12-inch tail number on the back of the airplane and constantly chirping ADS-B packets telling everybody exactly who you are and exactly where you are. People will call and complain about aircraft doing annoying things, so please be a good citizen. Don't be a jerk. Don't go buzz people's houses. Uh, probably don't go orbit somebody's house 10 times because <laughs> that can collect some negative attention. So yeah, data collection. Um, we did a series of test flights, kind of figuring it out as we went. Um, the first flight we took one phone, this uh, Google Pixel, which thankfully my girlfriend had to use because my phones are Apple, but we put Wiggle on it. I just kind of held it in my lap and we kind of flew around. Largely 1,500 to 2,500 feet um, at roughly 150 miles an hour. And, um, you know, where are the access points? We don't know. We know where we started seeing them and where we stopped seeing them. So we kind of have like a blob for each one, but we can't say, oh, that's at Sean's house down there. Um, if we can see them more than once over multiple flights, we could maybe pinpoint it a little better, but it's very inexact. So for our first flight, we took uh, three passes down Woodward Avenue, which if you're uh, a fan of cars, it's where they have the Woodward Dream Cruise. And, you know, we're from automotive. It's also Highway 1 in Michigan. Um, we did two at 2,500 uh, feet above sea level, which is 1,500 above ground, and then one at 3,500, which is 2,500 feet, with just my Android phone running. And uh, this map doesn't make a ton of sense to me because I'm not a pilot, but you can see the various airspaces that we were operating in and the uh, orange yellow squiggles are our actual flight path. But uh, for me, this is this makes more sense. This is actually a roadmap of where we were flying. So the uh, the circles you can see on the right side, that would be our our laps around Woodward. So data formats, Wiggle has their own proprietary format as a KML file, but they'll also output as CSV. We get one entry per observation out of Wiggle so we can track how many times we saw a specific point. Um, and it also includes altitude, which is nice for us. So we can correlate also that to our flight plan and where we were and whatnot. Um, and then what counts as airborne detection? Because we're seeing, as soon as we fire up the phone, we're seeing things. So we cap that at 500 feet above ground level is when we're going to consider it. We caught it in the air. And then we got home and we looked at the data and went, oh, there's a lot. I wasn't a lot more than we were expecting. At full disclosure, we both used GPT to help us with some Python to figure this stuff out. Um, so on our first flight, again, our maximum altitude 3,500 feet. We were in the air for about 32 minutes above 500. And we caught 2,822 unique BSS IDs or MAC addresses while we were in the air, which is 88 per minute. How far away? We did a lot of like mathing, trying to calculate distance and such. Um, and I was curious what the official spec is. The Wi-Fi Alliance doesn't really say explicitly Wi-Fi is good for this range, but 
it's about 150 feet. We kind of went past that quite a bit. So this was our first attempt to analyze the data. And if you look at it a little closely, you'll notice we have the same distance for every single device that we caught, right? The first sets of them. The yeah. first sets of them. Um, so then we flew again. We took a second flight, and this was your flight, right? Yeah. So then I was asking the question, okay, is it okay to war fly safely when you're solo? And I needed to go do some takeoffs and landings, so I thought, well, hey, maybe I'll uh, fire up the phone. So what I did, my procedure was fire up the phone during pre-flight before the airplane's on, start wiggle, leave it there. Don't touch it. Don't mess with it. Don't worry about it. And then go fly, come back, shut the airplane down, get everything good, then check the wiggle data. And that worked. So for this, I went to the, there's kind of a northeast practice area that's over an unpopulated area. A lot of flight training activity goes on up there. So I went to see what I could collect. Um, went up to 2,500 feet, 54 minutes, just under 6,000 access points for a rate, which, and I think this is a unique metric that nobody else has published. I could be wrong. I don't know. Maybe the war drivers do it, but max per minute. <laughs> So got 108 max per minute. Test three, similar exercise, just going up, flying around a little bit myself, had the phone mounted the same way, and got, went up 6,500 feet, uh, about 7,000 max, 130 max per minute. And then um, was working on the distance analysis and saw for that flight, we had like over a dozen where we had a starting and ending range where we saw them over a range of over five kilometers. So we were seeing them from a couple miles away, pretty sure. Um, top access points on this one, the top was nine kilometers and, uh, and then saw several of these 000D97s. And I don't know what they are, but it's registered to Hitachi Energy USA. So we're wondering if it's some kind of IoT energy distribution, something. We did talk to the ICS Village folks and they said, yeah, probably. So. Test four biennial flight review. The uh, quick story on that one was I was with an instructor but didn't have time to pay attention to the phone. Got back and, and uh, I just put it in my flight bag to see what would happen. And got back and realized that I didn't have any data. So the good thing was, or the bad thing was we lost the data. The good thing was I demonstrated that I was not getting distracted by the phone. And then, thank you. Don't get distracted by the phone. Right. Um, test flight number five, there is a path that you can take that's kind of a scenic river tour that avoids the controlled airspaces in downtown Detroit. So we decided to do that for our next test flight. And fun of fourth line, you get to take pictures like this. So we decided we were using two phones. Can we you know, get data a better way or a different way? So I also brought along a laptop running Linux with Lin SSID on it stuffed a USB uh, Wi-Fi card in the window. And then you can see, again, my pixel in the, the handle of the plane. Matt's Android was on the other side of the plane in his, his uh, handle. And uh, so we started counting MAC addresses at, you know, at different altitudes through Lin SSID and correlating that with, Linux, with Wiggle as well. Um, so with Lin SSID, I got 10,208 unique MAC addresses. Wiggle on my phone was super underperforming on this flight for some reason. It only got 2,753, but Matt was able to grab again almost 8,000. And then we again tried to do distance analysis on it. Um, so we've got again uh, our topping out at almost 10 kilometers, but most of them, you know, five or six. Um, and then I broke down the Lin SSID specifically as well. And one thing when I, Lin SSID, you can tune it. I turned it all the way down so it would sample constantly. That was a really bad idea. I had two gigabytes of data to try and wrangle. Um, but here's a list of the longest duration SSIDs I was able to catch out of Lin SSID. I still have the, the MAC addresses or the BSS IDs. Um, but yeah, the Krusty Krab is apparently a really long range Wi-Fi network in Metro Detroit. And a minute and a half of observation is about five and a half kilometers. 
And this is this is that same flight plan, right? Yeah, so this is the flight plan. So we wanted to compare altitudes. So we basically, uh, so I was using four flight. So flew kind of an S pattern over Lake Orion and Oxford, Michigan. Thank you to the citizens of Lake Orion and Oxford for letting us bother your skies that day. Um, one path at 2,500 feet and then climbed up to 3,500 feet and tried to just follow the same path. And you see how well I did or did not do. <laughs> so at 1,500, altitude of 1,500, we got 101 again, max per minute. Um, when we increase that by 1,000 feet, we're getting 49. So you can see the signals are starting to degrade the higher we're getting, but we're still getting some significant traffic. Wait, oh, I'm sorry, I'm hitting the wrong button. Um, so yeah, did we go too fast? I don't know, I don't think that's a thing you can do, let's go too fast, but... Um, yeah, so this was one thing that... Um we would like to explore more is what is the speed? Because we were going about 220 feet per second horizontally. Um, Wiggles seem to be taking samples about every five seconds, so that's about 1,100 feet per sample. So that may have impacted our ability to scan. And then we still had this kind of nagging question. Are we seeing a lot of data? Are we seeing more than we should be? Are we seeing less than we should be? So we decided to do some more driving. And since we love Woodward Avenue, uh, decided to go do a war drive from 11 mile road to Square Lake Road on Woodward, which is a distance of 9.8 miles. And you see the results there. War driving, we took 14 minutes to cover that path, speed of 42 miles an hour, and we observed 2,210 MAC addresses for a rate of 157 MACs per minute. War flying, we went a lot faster, covered the distance in four minutes at 148 miles an hour got about a third the number of max. We got a lot less max, 783, but we collected them a lot faster at 197 max per minute. So our conclusion from that is that, at least in this case, war driving collects more max, but war flying collects them faster. Right. So take your pick. I would say flying is probably more fun. Um, so yeah, a little more distance analysis. This is on the stretch, stretch down Woodward Avenue, which we had a discrete starting and stopping distance without any overlap so we could get a clear um, measure of how long we could see a signal without worrying about, oh, was it looping around and whatnot. Um, so again, our, our maximum distance here is about four kilometers. Um, what I find, one of the things I find really interesting, again, we got a car and then you connect based on a past thing I used to do. I know that's We love you connect. Car. Right. I love you connect. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but so we were able to catch cars from the air while we were flying or down sorry. Woodward. So this is, sorry, this was the war drive. Oh, was that the war drive one? Yeah. Okay. So this is the war drive one. And so what we see from here is the distance, um, cause we were like our top distances on the war flying were like nine kilometers, five kilometers. Um, these are down to like four. So we're pretty sure we were just tracking cars and then and then our old friend 000D97 shows up again something fairly visible from wherever but we were getting a lot less distance clearly with the war driving versus the war flying and then and then when you fly you have to take a cockpit selfie cuz it's cool and right. I can be like it's so cool I was flying you got to do it twice wait to do it again <laughs> So yeah, further investigation, um, you know, different speeds and altitudes. I would really love to just, you know, every 500 feet, same route and all that, but that takes a lot of time, uses a lot of fuel. Um, aircraft construction, do we get better results if we're in a composite aircraft without metal wrapping around us? And if uh, somebody wants to donate a Cirrus for further research, please also see me afterwards. Um, hardware platforms, maybe using some drones that could carry a payload, antenna placement, additional radios, um, and then so directional antennas, et cetera. Um, yeah, so that's what we got. So thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Thanks to Pontiac Tower and Detroit Approach for working with us, even though they had no idea what we were doing up there. Thanks to all the mats. There were more of them. <laughs> yes. There are mats at the Aerospace Village. We're all over the place. All right. Thank you all.